Very good. Thank you so much. I don't remember when I was uh, at, uh, is, are you Damon College or Demon College? <laughs> Uh, Damon, I don't some, some people think Damon, but it is Damon. Uh, but it, you were here when it was still Rosary Hill. Oh, I see. You had a different name. Yeah. Oh, oh. Well, well I, um, I don't remember what my what I read, but uh, in the years following, I usually started with a poem called "The Winners and the Losers" because um, I say I stood before them and told them of my life, the sorrows and the losses, in short, human condition. I could see them all so young, hair shiny, with their lives before. They were looking on me as a loser and had no pity, so determined, worthy, to make it big to be winners. Even the clerk in the social security office looked at me with wonder and asked, have you always earned so little? I had never thought of it that way. To her too, I was a loser, with bad luck all over my tax records. What happened to the beautiful losers of my youth who let the world destroy them and stay true to their dream? Scoffed at materialism, convention, a small, beleaguered man who kept their integrity against the world and devoted their lives to art, sex, and revolution. Youth believed in them, the madmen who burned themselves out with drugs and drink, disappeared into the desert, or battered society with their shiny heads. There was one period even when everybody was rushing off in search of the underground man. But now that winners are in fashion, disappearing are the last of the bohemians, left over from the old days of the village. And I am of another era, like the grizzled poet who slept in his village doorways and showed up at the poetry society with his life work in a shopping bag and read his poem, Crows. Caw, caw, he cried as he jumped off a table, flapping his arms. <laughs> Well, I can tell you that the village is very changed now. Uh, where we live, it's a very, very expensive, upscale real estate boom. And uh, our building, which is just the leftovers of the village, we're really a disparate uh, event will be gone very soon. But nevertheless, we're still here. Living in New York has always been a shock when they when students hear that I'm from New York, I always feel I have to defend it. And I have a poem called New York. I live in a beautiful place a city people claim to be astonished when you say you live there. They talk of junkies, muggings, dirt and noise, missing the point completely. I tell them if they live, it is hell, a land of frozen people. They never think of people. Home, I am astonished by this environment that is also a form of nature, like those paradises of trees and grass. But this is people paradise, where we the creatures most of them. Though thank God for dogs, cats, sparrows, and roaches. This vertical place is no more an accident than the Himalayas are. The city needs almost all buildings to contain the tremendous energy here. The landscape is in a state of balance. We do God's will, whether we know it or not. Where I live, the streets end in a river of sunlight. Nowhere else in the country do people show just what they feel. We don't put on any act. Look, 
Look at the way New Yorkers walk down the street. It says, I don't care. What nerve to dare to live their dreams or nightmares, and no one bothers to look. True, you have to be an expert to live here. Part of the trick is not to go anywhere. Lounge about, go slowly in the midst of the rush for novelty. Anyway, besides the eats, the big event here is the streets, which are full of love. We hug and kiss the pop. You can't say that for anyone else around. For some carnival of sex, there's all the opportunity in the world. For me, it's no different. Out walking, my soul seeks its it knows what it wants. Instantly, it recognizes its mate. Our eyes meet, and our beings exchange a vital energy. The universe goes on chalk, and we pass by without hope. Um, guess the book is a quite an adventure. An editor in uh, London, Diana Atfield, told me, do not put too many old age moments in your text book. But it turned out you can't, no. Because every year I write my, um, my poem for that year. And uh, when I turned to 80, I wrote a poem called Dead Man Poem. If you think it's a shock reaching 30, see, I'm really usually talking to students very young. If you think it's a shock reaching 30, just wait till it's 80. 80, I keep saying to myself. I'm 80 and life's quite normal. Still walking around, still jacking off. Of course, one spill and I could be in the village nursing home that I pass every day. We're waiting for you, the attendants' faces say as they enjoy their cigarettes on the sidewalk or chat on their cell phones. And the wrecks in wheelchairs up front look at me grimly as I lope by, which I read as, you think you're so smart, oh, you'll soon be right here with us. Actually, it's been months since my birthday and I'm still taking it in. And when the crucial event happens, I imagine it will also be a while before I wake up and realize who I am in a wheelchair, hospital bed, or coffin. One of the milestones of getting older is um, the cataract operation. I had mine at 83. And it was so casual. It felt so adult at 83, going by myself to the hospital, getting on bus like others, all the young headed for work, through the morning Manhattan streets, carrying umbrellas and newspapers, disappearing into subways, lining up at cards for a careless cholesterol rich paper bag breakfast. When the bus pulled up at the stop, I got out and walked in calm, like I remember the war flying into combat, with maybe a touch of nerves, but no great anxiety, more like excitement. Then it all went efficiently. The procedures of pre op as I was passed from station to station, each technician doing his job like once the squadrons of silver bombers in wing-to-wing -wing formation roared through the crystal sky, each of the crew busy, me at my desk with my instruments, calculating our course and noting in the log wind drift and speed and altitude, courteously calling navigators crew to read up our position and estimated time of arrival. Our goal of the mission that day was the rule, a land of mines and furnaces with a cataract of thick black smoke rising from the factories, cranking out anti-aircraft guns, like the ones lobbing up the deadly black burst at us. 
Now I was being wheeled into the hall outside the operating room, where I joined a line of gurneys waiting their turn at the laser. As the squadrons in stately procession wheeled, and a wide circle of the city lined up for the bombing run, as the flak peppered the air thickly under us. Finally, the moment, my moment, and I was moved into the operating room under a spotlight. My eye taped open, but my mind alert as the surgeon went to work, the oath of delicate with his instruments. And the earlier moment, our squadrons turn, our squadron turn. We head into formation, right into the midst of the bursting anti-aircraft shells. The Bombay doors opening for the grinding wine. Our wings were rocking perilously close to the neighboring planes, while the pilot fought to keep the heaving plane on course over the bullseye of the target below. And I too was bit deep. Shards of black rattling off the aluminum walls around me, my hand jiggling as I recorded in my log the burnt buildings, planes going down, the exact time of bombs away. Now to get out of here. It was over so fast. The nurse was already taking my eye, and I was wheeled back into the corridor, feeling happy, as on that day of the mission, we turned on a wing and wheeled west toward home, with the late sun lighting up the heavenly landscape of clouds, bright than I had ever seen it before. I read this poem on uh, Garrison Keeler's Prairie Home Companion a couple of years ago, and I was contacted by a, a German producer who heard it and had me uh, put me into a German documentary event called Flakhelfer, made by Bremen, uh, Bremen Radio and Television. And uh, it was about the teenagers who were impressed into service because of shortage of soldiers to shoot, to man the anti-aircraft guns. And these teenagers were shooting at us. And of course, in the sky, we were practically teenagers ourselves. Um, it was great fun doing the documentary, which showed on 4th of July, two years ago. It's a pity it's not available. The, the, the flak, the gunners were children. It was amazing. Um, the political situation is so ghastly all the time. The news from Washington is simply horrible. That it's wonderful. There's a wonderful folk tale that was told me by a Colombian friend um, that explained that describes it perfectly. Colombian gold. On the day God created the earth, all the angels flew round and round, singing chorales of praise. But over one place they stopped beating the air with their angel wings as their inspired voices rose to heaven. Here alone they trilled is paradise on earth, and it's called Columbia. Yes, God said, beaming at them wickedly, but wait till tomorrow and see who I'm going to populate it with. So I did the version for America. On the day God created the earth, all the angels flew round and round, singing growls of praise. Day after day, they celebrated as God produced from his fingertips plants and creatures, and according to an ancient tradition, in a final burst of genius, a diadem of cities. A chorus of hallelujahs rose from the angels over the glitter of Paris, London, Rome, until fluttering a convoy of a Colombian district dog, they looked down in awe at God's masterpiece, a perfect gem of a city with domed capital and avenues radiating like the rays around the crown of Athena, goddess of wisdom. Hail to the city of Washington, angels sang, from whose marble temples and pillared halls the people 
justly govern, and an eternity of goodness reign over the earth. Don't be too sure, said God, with his slyest grin. Wait till tomorrow and see who populate with. And then I'm going to do nothing for the rest of time but sit back and laugh watching what happens. <laughs> and of course, I have to read my poem about Bill Clinton, which is called My Favorite President. It's unbelievable uh, the hijinks that come out of Washington. He was like all of us who grew up on D.H. Lawrence and Henry Miller, still waving the banner of sexual freedom. He demonstrated that nothing stops you. You don't let anyone or anything, not even the CIA, out to catch you out, interrupt the sex life, whatever the price. He's the only president I wouldn't mind going down on. Listen to a frankly good looking guy like him. Sure, I'd stop that man's dick, anyone would. Can you imagine doing it with any of the others? Nixon, Harry Truman, George Washington, Honest Abe. He's the first one in 200 years who looks like he'd really enjoy it. Just a healthy slim boy who loves to lie back and be done that away. And most of the country feels just like me, that he's got a right. And even if he lies his head off when caught in the act, swears on a stack of Bibles, we still want him to get away with it. I myself have a very happy life with my partner of uh, 57 years. And when we met, um, I read in the New York Times that there was a, in that, the Coney Island Aquarium, there was a giant Pacific octopus. A oh, creature, I had to go see it. And I went out and I realized this was the perfect metaphor for my new relationship. I live with a giant Pacific octopus. He settles himself down beside me on the couch at the evening. With two arms, he holds a book that he reads with his single eye. He wears a pair of glasses over it for reading. Two more arms go walking over to the sideboard across the room where the crackers and cheese bread he loves are. And they send back endless canapes like a conveyor belt. While his mouth is drooling and chomping, another arm comes over and gropes me lightly. It is like a breeze on my balls, that sweet tentacle. Other arms start slipping around my body under my clothes. They wiggle right in, one around my waist and all over, and down the crack of my ass. I am drawn into his midst where his hot mouth waits for kisses. And I kiss him and make him into a boy, as all giant Pacific octopuses are really when you take them into your arms. All their arms fluttering around you become everywhere sensations of pleasure. So his sweet eye looks at me, and his little mouth kisses me, and I swear he is the body of a Greek god, my giant Pacific octopus boy chick. So this was what was in store when I first saw him in the aquarium, huddled miserably on the rock ignoring the feast of live crabs they put in his window slipping swimming pool. You take home a creature like that who needs love, who is a mess when you eat, but who can open up like a flower with petal up waving around a beauty. And it is a total pleasure to have him around, even collapsible as he is, like a big toy, for as long as he will stay, one night or a lifetime, for as long as God will let you have him. Of course, we broke up. And uh, I decided to recover, to go to the furthest country on earth uh, I could think of. 
which was Afghanistan. I spent the summer there, and it is a country with all of the invasions nobody has ever been able to subdue it properly. And of course, our adventures are absolutely insane. Anybody who knows that Afghanistan knows everything we've done there is insane. Once you've been stranded in desert, you love all fitness. The splash of fountains at sundown in dusty plazas, even the banal dribble of faucets become total pleasures. When a ramshackle bus breaks down on a remote plain, you wait and wait, squatting in its shadow with the robed and veiled, the more patient ones than you. You try to take comfort from the barren sweep of mountain ahead and the nomad encampment visible on a far slope as stony as this one. The ear is assailed by a buzz of insects, perhaps around a patch of stiff, staring white sunflowers rattled by gusts. Something grew them there, surely, but long ago. No water is wet enough to irrigate the thirst that grows here now, though Pepsi-Cola, if there was any, would be ambrosia. But the ancients say, better not drink in heat of day, wait for sundown. Still, the imagination goes desolate, pictures thirst-grazed, lost staggerers after illusory lakes on false horizons. Hours, or is it days of this? And when you can't stand it anymore, the first change occurs, like a shift in paper, a settling of the floor. You accept being stuck there. One place is as good as another, so why not here? Someone begins playing a wild jangle of music, and there is even a breeze. It is then a rescue comes, a truck crowded with molten-eyed men and rakish turbans, and you climb up onto piles of bags and back, full of some scratchy harvest of wool or wheat. And after an hour of bumping over a stony track, the mud walls greet you of an oasis town, where intense gardens and close pomegranate trees at once in fruit and flower. And finally, in a caravanserai hotel, where the men settle down cross-legged with pots of tea on rug-draped divans in the gloom, comes the ultimate soul-drenching blessing in the desert world, the world of the ancestors of the old power. In your room, strip off dust cake clothes down to tender skin, pores open to everything and turn on the shower. The uh, world of Afghanistan is a moonscape that you cannot believe anybody lives there, but you look at the worst unbelievable terrain and their people in. They manage. Of course, nobody else can. We can. One thing about a relationship uh, over a long period of time, you fall into um, sort of formulas. I, I wrote a, a series of poems about couple, couple psychology of couples. And my relationship turned out to be called nurses and patients. If we divide the world into nurses and patients, I am a born nurse, and you a born patient. I am in a passion of taking care of you, and you demand constant, unremitting attention. We found each other. Your ailments increase in scope and complexity as I struggle to keep you well, finding cures, solutions for your problems. Your needs are a mountain. I am an ant moving it grain by grain. I dare to stop for a moment. How to keep you alive, my darling, when life seems to have cheated you, 
rewarding you only with trouble galore. In your view, that is somehow all my fault. I am supposed to make it up to you, for you see me as one of the lucky ones who have been given everything in life, looks, lovers, success, and luck. My luck, angel, is only to have found you, the large, demanding child I adore, the child of the world I worship, the child of myself I care for, my sweet pet. The more I give, the more you demand. I can never do enough, if I know. Fair, fair. Still, I am grateful to have found a way to be useful in life. Thank you for that supreme gift. To me, you are a radiant being. I am honored to serve. Nurse has found the perfect patient. Patient, the perfect nurse. And care will be unrelenting. Both parts agree there will be no cure. I uh, come from a very, well, my generation was barely here from Europe. My parents were immigrants, immigrant Jews from Eastern Europe. And uh, I was raised really more in that mode than America. It's a very strange uh, duality because I really do belong to uh, the immigrant world with a great, much of it. Uh, I have a poem about the, the spirit of that world. My mother's family was made of loving women. They were, on the whole, bearers. Though Esther, the rich sister, had only one. She was the exception. Sarah, the oldest, had five with her first husband. That was still in Poland. Was widowed and came here where she married a man with four of his own. And together they had another five, all of whom she raised, feeding them in real aids, except little Tilly, who sat in the kitchen and ate with everyone, meaning all the time, resulting in a fat figure. The made her despair of ever finding a husband. But miraculously, she did. For God has decreed there is someone for everyone. If you're desperate enough, I will take what you can get. And Rachel had fell, raising him in the stable. She was married to a junk dealer who kept horses to haul the wagons. He was famous for his stinginess, so they lived in a shack surrounded by bales of hay. That was in America, in a slum called Bronzeville, that the black people have now inherited from the Jews, God help them. Then, as now, plenty of kids turned out bad, going to work for that Jewish firm, Murder Incorporated, or becoming junkies like one of my cousins did. My mother only had six, but that's not counting. I'll say no more than she was always pregnant with a fatalistic, what can you do? Plenty, her friend Blanche replied. She was liberated. You don't have to breathe like a rabbit. Like her mother, who had a baby a year in Poland until Grandpa left for America, giving her a rest. There were women who kept bearing even then, mysteriously, as from habit. Women were always tired in those days, and no wonder, with the broken down bodies they had in their guts collapsed. For with every child, they got a dragging down. My mother finally had hers tied back up in the hospital, and at the same time, they tied those over-fertile tubes, which freed them from God's terrible curse on women. And not just the bearing, but the work. The pots couldn't be big enough for those hungry broods. Sarah used hospital pots for hers. And then the problem filling the pots, getting up at dawn to go to the fishing boats, the huge fish carcass is cheap, buying bushels of half-spoiled vegetables for pennies, begging the butcher for bones, and then lugging it all home on their bad legs. They didn't think of their books for a minute. And better they didn't, shapeless at that life made them. 
And yet they were meant to try to put to their command by the evidence of their repeated pregnancies. They just went around in rags, all depressed, unable to cope or hide again in bed while the children screamed. Escape, escape, there must be escape, was my mother's theme song. Until at last, her children escaped from her and her misery, having wrecked her life, that endless sacrifice for what? I see the proletarian women like them on the streets, cows with unknown face, lugging black oil cloth shopping bags. The mamalas, the mamacitas, the mammies, the breeders of the world with loving eyes. They sit around the kitchen table with full hearts telling each other their troubles. Never enough money, the beasts that men were to them. The sorrow life was for a woman, a mother. The children turned out no good. And fed each other pieces of leftover meat from the icebox to make up a little for life's pain. And sighed, drank tea, and ate good bread and butter. I uh, escaped from that life into the army, which for me was a wonderful time. And uh, I became a, uh, a navigator in uh, B-17, the Flying Fortress, and flew uh, 27 missions over Berlin, all over Germany, uh, five over Berlin. And on my fifth mission uh, over Berlin, uh, my plane was shot down. It was over target Berlin, the flak shot up our plane. Just as we were dumping bombs on the already smoking city, on signal from the lead bomber in the squadron. The plane jumped again and again as the shells burst under us, sending jagged pieces of steel rattling through our fuselage. It was pure chance that none of us got ripped by those fragments. Then being hit, we had to drop out of formation right away, losing speed and altitude. And when I figured out our course with trembling hands on the instruments, I was navigator. We set our long trip home to England alone with two of our engines gone, and gas streaming at poles in the wing tanks. That morning at briefing, we had been warned not to go to nearby Poland, partly liberated then by the Russians. Although later we learned that another crew in trouble had landed there anyway, and patching up their plane somehow returned gradually to England, rounded out by way of Turkey and North Africa. But we chose England, and luckily the Germans had no fighters to set up after us then. For this was just before we developed their jet. To lighten our load, we think, we threw out guns and ammunition, my navigation books, all the junk, and made it over Holland with a few goodbye fireworks from the shore guns. Over the North Sea, the third engine gave out, and we dropped low over the water. The gas gauge went in, but by keeping the nose down, a little gas at the bottom of the tank sloshed forward and kept our single engine going. <clears throat> High overhead, the squadrons were flying home in formation. The raids had gone on for hours after us. Did they see us now that in our trouble? We radioed our final position for help to come, but I had no idea if anyone happened to be tuned in heard us, and we crouched together on the floor, knees drawn up and heads down in regulation position for ditching, listened as the engine stopped, a terrible silence, and we went down into the sea with a crash, just like hitting a brick wall, jarring bones, teeth, eyeballs, panicky. Who would ever think water could be so hard? You black out, and then come to with water rushing in, like a sinking ship moving. All 10 of us started getting out of there fast. There was a convenient door in the roof to climb out by, one at a time. We stood in line, 
water up to our thighs and rising. The plane was supposed to float for 20 minutes, but with all those flak homes, who can say how long it really would? The two life rafts popped out of the sides into the water, but one of them only half inflated, and the other could hold everyone, although they all piled into it, except the pilot, who got into the limp raft that just floated. The radio operator and I, out last, did not mean we were less aggressive, least likely to survive, to survive. We stood on the wing, watching the two rafts being swept off by the waves in different directions. We had to swim. Later, they said the cords holding rafts to plane broke by themselves. But I wouldn't blame them for cutting them loose, for fear that by waiting, the plane would go down and drag them with it. I headed for the overcrowded good raft, and after a clumsy swim in some limp flying clothes, got there and hung onto the side. The radio operator went for the half-inflated raft where the pile lay with water sloshing over him. But he couldn't swim even with his light star. Being from the Great Plains, his strong farmer's body didn't know how to wallow through the water properly and a wild current seemed to sweep him farther off. One minute we saw him on top of a swell, and perhaps we glanced away from him, but when we looked again, he was gone. Just as the plane went down sometime around then, when nobody was looking. It was midwinter, and the waves were mountains, and the water, ice water. You could live in it 25 minutes, the ditching survival manual said. Since most of the crew was squeezed on my raft, I had to stay in the water, hanging on. My raft? It was their raft. They got there first, so they would live. 25 minutes I had. Live, live, I said to myself, you've got to live. There looked like plenty of room on the raft from where I was, and I said so, but they said no. When I figured that 25 minutes were about up and I was getting numb, I said I couldn't hold on anymore. And a little rat-faced boy from Arkansas, one of the gunners, got into the icy walk of my place. And I got in the rat and he is. He insisted on taking off his flying clothes, which was probably his downfall, because even wet clothes are protection. And then he worked hard, kicking with his leg, and we all paddled to get to the other raft, and we tied them together. The gunner got in the raft with the pilot and lay in the wet. Shortly after, the pilot started gurgling green foam from his mouth. Maybe he was injured in the crash against the instruments. And by the time we were rescued, he and the little gunner were both dead. That boy took place of war, who died instead of me. I don't remember his name even. It was like those who survived the death camps by letting others go into the ovens in their place. It was him or me, and I made up my mind to live. I'm a good swimmer, but I didn't swim off in that scary sea looking for the radio operator when he was washed away. I suppose then, once and for all, I chose to live rather than be a hero, as I still do today. Although at the time, I believed in being heroic, in saving. Even if, when opportunity knocked, I instinctively chose survival. As evening fell, the waves caught down. And we spotted a boat far off and signaled a flare gun, hoping it was English, not German. The only two who cried on being found were me and a boy from Boston, both of us gay. The rest of the crew kept straight faces. It was a British inner sea rescue boat. They hoisted us up on deck, dried off the lid, and gave us whiskey to the bed, and rolled the dead up in blankets, and delivered us all to a hospital on shore for treatment and disposal. This was a minor accident of war. Two weeks in a rest camp in Southport, 
on the Irish Sea, and we were back at Rath Honeywood, our base, ready for combat again. The dead crewmen replaced by lytic ones and went on hauling bombs over the continent of Europe, destroying the Germans and their cities. The uh, boy who died in my place, the little gunner, I and a woman I am acquainted with whose father also crashed over Berlin and became a prisoner of war. She and I together are trying to contact government figures who might give that heroic kid some recognition, though it's very late and there's nobody left in his family that we can find. Still, the trying. It really was in the back of my mind all these years, I never did it. Of course, although there was the most exciting time of my life being in combat, flying missions, bombing missions over Germany, you really go crazy because you change fear into excitement. And the excitement is intense and it's not normal. And that's, you get it. And I started volunteering for missions toward the end. I was so crazy. So when I came back to civilian life, of course, I eventually cracked up and uh, had years of therapy. And one of my experiences in therapy, where you're trying to put myself together, I had an experience, I was in group therapy, and one day I stood up at the group, forced myself to my feet, and uh, everybody said, sit down, what are you doing? And it opened up like a fist in myself opened up. And I wrote a poem about it, a journey. When he got up that morning, everything was different. He enjoyed the bright spring day, but he did not realize it exactly. He just enjoyed it. And walking down the street to the railroad station, past magnolia trees with dying flowers like old socks, it was a long time since he had breathed so simply. Tears filled his eyes and it felt good, but he held back because men didn't walk around crying in that town. And waiting on the platform at the station, the fear came over him of something terrible about to happen. The train was late and he recited the alphabet to keep hold. And in its time came screeching in and as it went on making its usual stops, people coming and going, telephone poles passing, he hid his head behind the newspaper, no longer able to hold back the songs and willed his eyes to follow the rational movings of the sea fabric. He didn't do anything violent, as he could imagine. He cried for a long time. But when he finally quieted down, the place in him that had been closed like a fist was open. And at the end of the ride, he stood up and got off that train. And through the streets and in all the places he lived in later on, he walked himself at last, a man among men, with such radiance that everyone looked up and wondered. I see, I've, I've planned on many, many more poems in this time for. I will go uh, next to a wonderful uh, recognition. Old friend, we've come through. In pretty good shape so far. Better, in fact, than during those angst-filled years when you, you wrecked my life and I wrecked yours, remember? But back then, we didn't appreciate each other, did we? 
like an ill-matched couple, a bad job by an incompetent marriage broker who just got married out of general horniness rather than any real compatibility. I never liked your looks or signs, and you had ideas of your own I couldn't figure out. So I responded to your goading and roamed the nights away. By God, what you led me into, and I got you into some pretty tight fixes myself. Life is let straight. In our golden years, we make demands. We've both come to like a bit of a wank, with none of the old recriminations after. And I've even learned to admire, as I pose in the mirror, your silky length. Respect is the independence. I wonder that I ever thought you insufficient, myself under and down, or else you've grown. Best of all, impressed by how good we look together. The proportions seem just right. So, good cock, dick, prick, dong, lul, pita, schwanz, wang, willy, weenie, and all your other names. If you've a mind to now, and I'd say you've earned it, stand up, old friend, with me and take a bow. I have a poem that could be equally good for me at 93, my current age, as when I wrote it at 87. But I'll leave it the way I wrote it. I, my poem of 93 is still fit, unfinished. At 87, it's hard to believe, but I simply have no complaints. I'm a pretty healthy fellow. Of course, I'm a New Yorker, and we reel off our symptoms to anyone who will listen. So I listen and chuck and cluck in sympathy, unable to add to the stew pot of misery with my nothing aches and pains. What's to complain about? I have a great apartment with a tree embracing it. I live with someone I worship. Looking at him after 50 years still makes me smile and tingle. I go on writing my poems and even get attention from my fans. And money, I have not Well, okay, the monthly government handout that pays the bills. I have enough of my mind left to know how lucky I am. I could even solve the world's problems if only they ask me or if they read my poems. And with all that to celebrate, my dick and I are still talking or rather John State. Even at the alarming age of 87, and even if it all goes downhill from here as a must eventually or tomorrow, meanwhile, facing the inevitable, I'm the man with everything. My, and I'll end with my 86, my age 86 poem. It's called Proclamation. At 86, I proclaim victory. I raise my fists above my head and proclaim victory. Not over anything, but in life. I have emerged victorious in my life. It just occurred to me to be victorious. I am, that's all. Why didn't I think of it before? It's so easy. You proclaim victory, and it's like the lights are switched on. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to achieve anything. You don't even have to proclaim it. Just raise your arms and you're free of that suffering. It's freedom from all that. You've taken over his consciousness. I raise my fists above my head in the air. Look in my face. It's the face of victory. Amazing. The more I do it, the easier it gets. I can raise my arms in victory anytime. It's so easy. Everybody knows how to do it. Just raise your fists in the air and proclaim victory. I did, uh, I did a, a program in Holland in The Hague with my brother-in-law, Ak van Royen, who was wonderful trumpet player and flugelhorn player, very famous in Europe. 
And uh, when I did the, raised my arm, they all, the whole audience raised their <laughs> This It was wonderful. The farewell. They say the ice will hold. So there I go, forced to believe them, my act of trusting people, stepping out. And naturally, it gapes up. And I, forced to carry on coolly by my act of being imperturbable, slide erectly into the water wearing my captain's helmet, waving to the shore with a sad smile. Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye, dear one, as the ice meets again in my head with a click. Thank you very much. Edward, would you answer some questions? Of course, of course. I have one. Um, when, uh, back in the 1960s, uh, there was a pension for dividing groups of poets up into into uh, schools. I mean, there was the uh, Black Mountain School, the San Francisco School, and of course there was the New York School, which had so many poets of such diverse talents and styles, like Ashbery and <coughs> and, uh, and yourself and Frank O'Hara. Uh, is there anything that really ties you all together, other than being in New York? But to tell the truth. The reason I got into the New York School of Poets was because I had an affair with Frank O'Hara. <laughs> it's uh, actually, <laughs> my poetry had nothing to do with the New York School, though it's come to be like me. But I really was connected with Long Beach School. In fact, I was considered Long Beach. And a lot of people like Gerald Buckland, Charles Stetler, Ron Kirkty, and many others, poets, all said that I was there, I and Charles Bukowski were their two models. Now, I'm nothing like Charles Bukowski, except that I use the normal language, the language of every day. And, uh, but that is essentially my school. I feel that's really where I fall. In New York, it was very good for my career to be included with the New York poets in that model of Helen anthology that became very influential. But also the poems they included in it were not my, not ones I would include. I didn't really feel I belonged with those people. They were very American. They felt like they were kings of New York. I always felt like an underdog crawling around. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there's one thing I did want to say, and I didn't, Peter. I didn't say that uh, this is extraordinary, this event. I did do a sight reading in Italy in a cafe in Milan. But I don't think it's been done in America. And you were really very courageous to set this up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I wish more people would have had that, had, had that opinion. Uh, are there any other questions that you'd like to ask? Ah, you have to go up there. Oh. I just had uh, two questions for you. Uh, one, uh, most of the poems that you were talking to had dealt with the idea of uh, the struggle of life and living and also being in New York. How do you uh, feel about the, uh, the, the, uh, the stopping of the print edition of Village Voice? Because it seems like the village is such an important part of you and the Village Voice. Could you comment on that? Yes, well, the village is gone. The village is a high rent. Village used to be cheap, a wonderful neighborhood that uh, kids could come from all over the country, or adults, they were escaping from oppression. And the village was a scene that they could find a cheap apartment and um, enjoy 
there was racial integration, there was sexual freedom for all kinds of people. It was an incredible place, and it went on for a number of generations. It's finished. Nobody can afford to live here. My neighborhood is unbelievably expensive. Real estate agents would love to get a hold of this building I live in, but it was set up as a foundation for artists and all the leftovers of the village, when the village went upscale, were gathered in. And so we lived here with very reasonable rents, and nobody else, the kids can't afford it to come here. They go, I really pity them. I don't know where they go. They go to I guess Brooklyn and Queens and the fringe. They're on the fringes. So it's actually um, gone. The village is here. Uh, that's sad. And could you also uh, uh, talk about what it's like? Uh, this is your talk, maybe think about your novel. Could you talk about what it's like? Uh, how was it for you writing fiction along with being uh, a poet? Did you find uh, the transition difficult or was it a very easy uh, thing to do? It went in stages. I got, I, I never could have written prose um, without um, the, it wasn't a computer I first got. It was, uh, what, what do they call it? It was like a primitive. Word, see, a word, a word processor? It was a what? A word processor? Yes, it was a word processor and it was very simple and as soon as I started writing on that screen, I started writing essays. And the essays that finally became my book, The Man Who Would Marry Susan Sontag, they were collected into that book. But then, um, so I started writing prose that way. And then my uh, partner, Neil, went blind. And he was a novelist. And he had written a lot of books and it was, came naturally. And um, a friend, uh, an editor we knew, see, that's one of the things about living in New York and being known, is that you, you know editors. And an editor said, why don't you guys write a novel about Greenwich Village, the history of Greenwich Village? And, oh, he said, I like your idea about writing... And because we had never proposed an idea, he just wanted us to do it. And so we sent him a synopsis about a family living in the village from 1845 to the end of the Vietnam War. And uh, Neil could write anymore himself, so I worked with him. And so we worked together. I learned the mystery. It, people who have talent for plotting. That is not a simple talent. I had no talent for that. But working with Neil, I learned to do it. And I could come up with my own ideas. Of course, my own ideas and his ideas conflicted horribly how we fought to the death. But uh, we did write several novels together. And lots of plots. We have loads of plots we worked on. Some of them would make terrific novels. But... Um, that's how I got into novel writing. But uh, we have stopped. Uh, unfortunately, we have stopped. It finally, I, I think the thing is when you get very old, <laughs> you start giving up a lot. A lot of things that live much simpler. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, I have a question. What was in that awkward state where you do more questions? Uh, well, you have a, but now it's been filmed, right? Yes, yes. So you have a copy for the show. Yes. People weren't there. Right, oh yeah. Right. It's going to be available. And Next. Um, also, <clears throat> I will be in touch with you. I'm going to send you a copy of the, the beautiful uh, uh, poster that we had advertising this event. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to see it. Um, and uh, the uh, address on your on your website is still the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll send you. I'll send you. If it's not, I can't remember. Of course, it's the same. I. I you can move for now. <laughs> okay. I'm stuck here.
So, does anybody else want to say anything to Edward? Edward, thank you. This has been so wonderful. I want to thank Jim, especially. Oh, I yes. Mean, He's been the catalyst for this. Jim is, is amazing the way he did the technical. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me to Damon College.